exciting. <laughs> okay. Oh, just move myself off the screen. Just a good start, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody, and welcome to this Facebook Live. Um, today, I'm joined by Bobby Banbury, um, who is a fantastic um, behavior consultant and trainer based in the US. Um, for those that don't know you, Bobby, could you start off by perhaps just introducing yourself a little bit and telling us all, yeah. Oh, yeah, a little bit about, about you and, and, and what you do? Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm really, really honored to be here on your page and with your community. I'm a certified dog behavior consultant. I'm the director of education at Behavior Vets, which is a veterinary behavior practice that also offers behavior consulting, therapy, modification, that kind of work. And we work with all species. So it's very cool to have the doctors and the behavior consultants in-house um, partnering together for our clients and supporting them. I've been doing this for maybe 25 years. It's crazy, like dog training. Um, I'd say I became a behavior consultant uh, maybe 10 or 15, like 15 years ago. And I've been with behavior vets for five years. I started in the shelter world. Um, I don't know if you guys know the organization, the ASPCA. It used to be a tiny little organization in New York City. And now it's um, national. And so a lot of what I've learned talking about resilience and talking about stress, um, bouncing back, recovering, all of those things. It really started by observing shelter dogs. I also love dog sports. I'm in, I'm an agility addict, enthusiast and competitor. I have seven dogs, three of which are currently either training for or competing in agility. So that's me in a nutshell. And I live in Southern New Jersey with my very patient and understanding husband considering I seven <laughs> dogs. <laughs> seven dogs. That's <laughs> yeah, it's a little bananas. <laughs> Lots of work to kind of, yeah, keep your household go running smoothly, I imagine. It is nonstop. Yes. Seven oh. is a lot <laughs> for me. <laughs> Have you got space for more or is seven the limit? Seven's the limit, even though we do have space for more. <laughs> yeah, I think five is a good number for me, but it's um, it's good. They're, they're a really good gr group of dogs. I have four little terriers that one of which is, he likes to sit right here. Here's Marble. He likes to sit behind me when I'm on my office desk. Mm -hmm. He's, I used to do agility with him. He's retired. He's 10. Um, he taught me so much about resilience um, because just working with him operantly wasn't working. It wasn't enough. He needed more. And so he really started that journey for me with my own dogs and in the world of dog sports. Um, and then I have... Two other terriers here <laughs> in my room with me, uh, a Border Collie Whippet, a Croatian Sheepdog Border Collie Mix, and those two guys also do agility. And then one of my terriers. Wow. And it's amazing hearing about um, your lifestyle and 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 your um, <laughs> and the and the different kind of things that you've got going on in terms of not being just in behavior consulting, not just being in agility, but kind of having all those different nets and sort of also yeah. working with behavior vets as well. Um, so th there's obviously so much to what you do, yeah. and given the topic of this being resilience and and, and the work you and um, Kathy have done in the past year or so, is it now with, with resilience? I think yeah. I remember it sort of a year ago, was it, that I was first hearing about this starting to, to crop up a little bit. Um, it, it, it really kind of occurred to me just listening to you now, how, how multifaceted it is as a concept to think about that okay. idea of resilience isn't just being something that applies to the dogs that are fearful. It's not just something that applies to the dogs going into agility training for the first time. It's such a important concept for dogs kind of in all corners of the, um, or all corners of the sort of our industry of how we, what way we may be working with dogs. Absolutely. So, um, you know, there's the result thinking about resilience, there's resilience in terms of raising your puppy, whether you're raising your puppy to live in an urban area, like I've I've worked in New York City for many years, um, or you're raising your puppy to do dog sports, or you're raising your puppy, and you have, you know, a busy household with children, um, or you're adopting a shelter dog, or you're working or volunteering in a shelter, and you're trying to support the dog's mental and physical well-being, while they're waiting to be adopted, right? And then there's the resilience of behavior work where you're 
trying to work with a dog to help them addressing fears, phobias, aggression issues, whatever's going on that might um, have caused or resulted in the client calling you. Um, and then there's the resilience that you have to think about as the dog is aging. And you have to think about like different life stages, whether they're geriatric senior. I have a 14 and a half year old dog and her ability to deal with stress has significantly gone down because she has Cushing's disease. And so the way that her body, like there's more adrenaline, more cortisol that's pumping through her body and was like that for many, many months, if not longer, until we discovered she has Cushing's disease. And so now she's on medication. It's only been a couple of months. And, but her neurobiology has changed because, you know, how long was she exposed? Her body was exposed to that in the increase in adrenaline and cortisol. So it's going to take time for her body to adjust to the medication. And also we have to keep retesting to see if the dosage is right. And so there's, and then there's resilience during adolescence, which completely is different from any other life stage because they're hormonally changing and they're less resilient, more resilient day to day, really depending on context to context and then how you work with the dog. And I don't know if, I know you've had Dr. Kathy Murphy on, but I'm not, don't remember what you guys talked about. Um, I peeked in for a little bit at the end, but um, you know, she's talked, she's taught me so much about what's happening in the adolescent brain. And um, they just need so much more support than we know to give. And in dog sports or in any, or just like life, there is so much training that's happening for the dog during that phase of life. Cause they're adjusting to living with their people, whether adopted from a shelter or they're leaving puppyhood, which happens pretty quickly. If you think about having a dog in your life, like you might get them at 10 weeks old, but 10 to six months can go really fast. And now suddenly for almost two years, you've got an adolescent. And that's when a lot of the, you know, folks are training recall or manners or bringing them out into the world. And, and now they're dealing with adolescents. And then the sports world, there's so much training of those skill sets that you need for that sport. But hormonally, the dogs and, and in terms of brain function and structure, as you know, with the work that you're doing, it's so different and it's so hard for them. So yeah, like the resilience conversation, it's dynamic and it keeps changing based on life stages, what's going on for the dog, learning history, you know, what is, what is your focus? If there's so much to it, context, environment. And it's, so it's a big conversation. Yeah. And I, I think it's just, just, one thing that fascinated me there that, that you mentioned is, um, and sorry, we'll come back around to the resilience rainbow and yeah, sort of yeah. introducing everything in a little bit. But um, one thing that really struck me was you, you spoke about how adolescents, their resilience can sort of almost change from day to day. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you had any examples or any cases you can think of of where you've had to practically almost like change your plans or change the, oh, your yes. structures, approaches to sessions because of where that individual's resilience is at a particular day and secondly how you can gauge that as well yeah so gate it's really learning your dog so i have a seven month old border collie croatian sheepdog and croatian sheepdogs can be like watchdogs in a sense like you know they're one of their jobs is to alert of some danger or something unusual in the environment and um so there's that genetic component for my dog and he's seven and a half months old. So there, his name is Drazen. He was, he's from Croatia. So he was named after a basketball play, player from the nineties, Drazen Petrovic that was drafted to the American like basketball league. So my husband was like, can we name this dog? I said, since this is number seven, you can name this dog. <laughs> so his, so, so Drazen was, um, like, you know, I'll give you an example in class recently. So we were in class and um, this was like three weeks ago and we were training a skill, like a really basic foundation skill. And he heard a dog barking in the next space, in the next room training, right? And so he just started to alert bark as well. I went right into some of the games, like the pattern games to help bring him, to help him recover and then re-engage with me. And then last week we were training 
um, a little like sequence. He was just going through a tunnel and then a little, not a jump, but just um, around a wrapping a wing, we would call it. So he's just practicing following me and wrapping a wing. And a dog came into the building. It didn't bark. It was a new dog, unfamiliar dog came into the space. He noticed it, came right back to me. You know, what was the difference? Sorry. <laughs> What was the difference there, right? It's just, it's a few weeks apart. Um, I could say that I'm an excellent trainer, which I think I am. Um, and whatever I was doing in the moment that helped help, helped him stay focused on me. We could say maybe it was the bark versus the non-bark. Um, but there are days that he can walk into an environment where the dogs are barking and he's fine, or he'll hear a dog bark and it doesn't bother him. And then there, or the neighbor's dog. We have a, a, a neighbor, whose dog barks a lot <laughs> but there are days that he doesn't even notice the dog barking it just goes into the back one and then there are days that he'll alert to the dog barking right and so what's different all I can think about or all I can um, suspect is that it has something to do with this stage in his life where certain days his brain is processing information in one way and then certain days they're not and so what my job is to do is to assess where he is today. So like, for example, today he is, I don't know what's going on with him today, but he's just alerting to everything today in the house, even, even with my husband walking around, um, the AC went on, which is a noise that happens all the time. And today he was alert barking to it. And I'm not making a big fuss about it, not making a big deal. I just recognize that he's an adolescent. So potentially there's going to be a change in how he's processing and the environment, especially if that is something that genetically there's a high possibility of him behaving that way. Yeah, I think that that's, I mean, that's so much to think about, isn't it? And I think one thing there as well, in some of the examples you gave is that, that the kind of, again, really struck me is, is a lot of those things, for example, your dog next door or your yeah. You know, the, the unpredictable things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis or another dog kind of turning up unexpectedly. It's usually other dogs, isn't it, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, some of those unpredictable things are really, really hard to control. And yeah. um, particularly kind of thinking of dogs that are living in city environments. I work with, I'm based in the southeast of England, but I work with quite a lot of dogs based in London and based in very busy cities. Um and I can't quite remember where you're based, but I, you're in Detroit, right? No, Southern New Jersey, oh, very Southern far New Jersey. from Detroit. But I did work in New York City for many, many years. Um, yeah. And then in 2020, we moved to Southern New Jersey. So most of my work now is virtual. Uh, but yeah, the city, any urban environment is unpredictable. The level of noise, activity, um, foot traffic, people, dogs, construction. It's It's a lot. It's a lot for their senses to have to pr take in all that in that input and then process it yeah and and it's, it's tough when we think about it from that kind of typical behavior change approach of where we remove all those triggers and we we isolate the dog away from them so then we can reintroduce them yeah. in that environment because i mean some of the dogs i've worked with it's just completely would be unrealistic to take all those things away it's just impossible without kind of nailing the dog into like a box a soundproof right, vision like proof box. yeah i really saw you know when i i you know we we're like raised so to speak or like trained as dog trainers to work through the operant model and then the longer i worked in new york city the more i was thinking well this isn't working right like giving dogs treats when i see another dog is yeah i'm maybe holding their attention or I'm managing the situation, but they're not feeling better about the dogs. And um, who's to say everything else is not also impacting them. And I, rem I remember in my first year at Behavior Vets, I had a client, the dog was really fearful in New York City. And so started Behavior Meds, we did a lot of work. They live near a very, like a block away from a large, like Central Park, which is acres and acres, like hundreds of acres in the middle of New York City, of Manhattan. And um, so I said, we're going to go to the park. Like, that's where you're going to walk in. We're going to, you know, build his, um, and at the time I wasn't using the word resilience, but I said bandwidth a lot. And it's like, we just need to expand his bandwidth so he can deal with the stressors of the city. And he made a massive, over time, massive improvement. And 
the one thing that wasn't improving was the separation anxiety. And I had a feeling that the separation, and, and she was just overwhelmed with like being a single person, a little older, um, and not a lot of support for her dog and feeling like a prison. And she also felt like her young dog, it was a very young dog, um, that his quality of life was being compromised in the city. And I, and I kept like, I knew that the separation anxiety was there because of his general anxiety disorder. Like that's what he was diagnosed with and just the urban living, like just fear of living in New York city, just all that comes with it. And sure enough, he went to a rural area in Pennsylvania, uh, foster, uh, he was a Dachshund and, or he is a Dachshund. And so a rescue took him in, you know, and over time, what they noticed is separation anxiety went away. His, um, he was less fearful. They were able to wean him off behavior meds. And I just thought, and, and he did get adopted into a household with another dog, several people in the household, but they had reported that he had no separation anxiety. And I thought, well, that is incredible. Like his resilience was chipped away so much so with everything it took to live in an urban environment that he couldn't stand to be alone. Like he just couldn't handle being alone. And then once you know, his nervous system came down to baseline and really was able to exist for a long period of time, feeling like, okay, I'm safe and secure. You know, he, a lot of those anxieties just went away. It was incredible to see. And I just, so just witnessing that, I, it made me think more and more about what it takes to manage stressors and what it takes. And it's beyond trigger stacking. And then that, and it's also Kathy, Dr. Murphy and I, had many, many conversations. Um, we've been friends for almost 12 years. And so we've been at the same time, had many conversations about our own dogs, what we were seeing in the industry. I would talk to her about things that I was seeing with my clients and ask her questions. And then a lot of the struggles I was having with my little red dog terrier, Marvel, that I just showed you um, in agility and just saying, you know, like just in doing like counter conditioning, it's not working. And there's no way to counter condition and, and desensitize an entire city. Like there's no way to counter condition and desensitize a competition, an entire competition environment. So that's how resilience started to come into the conversation in a way that I was like, oh, I have new language to look at what I'm doing with my dog. Yeah. And I think from, from conversations we've had before, that was actually a fair few years ago that you first started to think about this idea of resilience. Um, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. It was, I think, Marvel's 10 now. So I'd say about more than 10. I'd say like eight or nine years ago, wow. nine years ago. He was about a year old when um, his behaviors, he became highly reactive. He became aggressive. It was like a light switch had just shifted. And ultimately what happened is um, it was beyond trigger stacking. It's just his nervous system was so overwhelmed by everything happening in the environment. And I'm sure there was other things going on, like genetics, like he was entering adolescence, all the things that could potentially lead up to like a perfect storm of a situation. But it felt to me at the time, like suddenly I have this aggressive little terrier and nobody can handle him and nobody could touch him. And it truly took him three weeks to come back down to baseline. Like he had to live in his harness. I couldn't take it off. He didn't want anyone touching him. I was the only one that could manage him at the time. And I remember being very emotional and overwhelmed. And because um, I was like, this isn't the dog I adopted. Like what happened to my cute little terrier that I was doing agility with? And I thought we couldn't do agility because he was going to be aggressive towards people and other dogs. And it was just, it was overwhelming. Um, and it was a systematic process beyond training and really looking at like the neurobiology of what's going on. And again, I didn't, I was discovering the language. And I remember reading a blog from Patricia McConnell and she was talking about trauma and resilience in her blog. And I thought, wow, some of this stuff is like what I'm doing with my dog. And so then I started sharing that with Kathy and we started talking more and more about resilience and more about 
Um, it's, you know, more than just operant conditioning and more than counter conditioning and desensitization. And so it was really cool to sort of play around and discover how can I indirectly, you know, build my dog's ability to handle the stressors of a competition environment? How can I build his ability to feel comfortable around unfamiliar people and unfamiliar dogs and not feel like he has to go attack everybody without having to necessarily like go through a process of counter conditioning and desensitization like every single dog in person and recognizing through this exploration that that could feel like a lot of pressure for him just like over facing him by putting him in these situations to say like now you're going to meet this guy even if I felt like I was setting up the space or the situation where he's under threshold or the other dog um And you just, like you said, for urban environments, you can't manage every single situation. And I I remember, and then going back to my clients in this, in New York city, they were frustrated. They were like, why, you know, they had an expectation of if I do the work, this should get better. My dog should feel better about dogs. My dog should not worry about bikes, people and bikes going by. And I got it. I was like, I also started to think like, why isn't this working, right? And so it's just so much more complex than just doing that training, that kind of transactional training. Yeah, and I think it's so interesting the way you describe that because of course, we've all done a lot of that kind of very transactional training. It's kind of particularly in our industry, one of the first things that you get taught when you're going into this sort of work. And I think, I don't know if it's something you've thought about, but um or got a sort of a better terminology before than I have but um I think kind of often what you see with these sort of truly resilient dogs is sort of a a, a, you can almost see similar behaviors to another dog in another situation so for example you can have one dog that's kind of appearing to cope fairly well with agility appearing to kind of go through the motions of getting through there whereas you can have one dog that's again looking pretty similar but then if you know something unexpected happens you know a, a dog runs up or something strange happens or something yeah that the dog hasn't practiced for it kind of feels like there's almost with some of the operant training that we do we can get into kind of a a false sense of security or a false sense of sort of superficial resilience um because this dog is coping with this thing that they couldn't cope with before but what we don't see is this actual sort of um the dog being in a psychologically good enough place to actually really to be able to cope with those circumstances. They're mm-hmm. kind of, I suppose, surviving, not thriving in those circumstances. Yep. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. I don't know if you have any terminology or any better terms <laughs> for that, having thought about it a lot more than me, but yeah. Yeah. So yeah, survive. So it's really, it goes back to what I was learning from Kathy in the sense of, um, you know, just, when a dog is exposed over and over again, or overfaced, or, and I'll go back to agility because I'll, or dog sports in general, because I've seen this happen. I've had this experience with my own dogs. Um, and then I talked to a lot of people, instructors that have also seen this with their students is that the dog will start out strong and have by like two, two years old, it seems like they're really a solid dog. And then between the age of two and three, the performance starts to decline when they're competing. And what's going on there is very likely, a, a, like again, a perfect storm of a situation, but essentially the resilience conditioning, really flexing that nervous system to manage, to deal with stressors um, is missing. They don't have that ability. Now it's different if you're raising a dog to like, hang out with you and watch TV and then take some walks around the block. And, you know, like it, it's, you don't need that same level of like, oh, I've got to like thoughtfully make it part of my program. If that's what I'm doing to train the dog. Um, I think that if a dog is living in complex environments, like urban areas, or if they're going to do complex activities like dog sports, it is really important to consider resilience as part of how you raise them. Because what's because ha- what you're doing is you're impacting the neurobiology of the dog. It's beyond them choosing like, oh, I see that judge, and this time the judge is a man who's really tall and is wearing a hat, 
and that's weird right and I've never seen that before and then like dog a is like yeah whatever I'm gonna go to keep doing my weave poles and dog b is like whoa that's really weird right and you don't have to necessarily um work the issue of like this judge is wearing a hat and you know make that part of your training but there's things that you can do as you're raising your puppy to support their nervous system and recovering from stressors over and over and over again. And the other thing that's happening is that we as handlers or trainers, um, we're not, we're human. We're not perfect. We screw up. Like we make mistakes and complex sports require us to be part of the game, especially agility, for example, like we're handling, I feel like it's dancing with your dog in the ring. So and it's challenging every time you compete. So I'm going to make mistakes for sure. And my dog might think like, I'm perfect. I'm doing everything right. And we keep stopping and you keep telling me I'm wrong. And like, it becomes a real bummer for them. And then could you imagine being told you're wrong over and over and over again? Like it just can deflate you. Right. And so can the dog be resilient to that? And if they can't be like, we have to teach them and teach them, I say in quotes, because it's about the nervous system again, the neurobiology to like deal with my person is making mistakes or deal with my person um, needs to redo this over and over again to practice their own handling mechanics. It becomes, um, yeah, it's like to be told you're wrong over and over again can be really demotivating, essentially. And that over time can affect their desire to want to play, can affect their engagement. And that's just in the sports world. That's just one example for the sports world. Yeah. And I, I think, as you say, there's so many examples that kind of come up with that. But I think the, yeah, the, the being told they're wrong, right, is something that dogs face a lot or finding out that they're wrong or finding out that the rules have changed as they do kind of oh, God, not yeah. even intentionally, right? And some of the things that we do with our dogs, the rules just kind of suddenly change <laughs> because suddenly you're in a new house or suddenly we've got a new routine or even yeah, kind of those you're wearing days. a nice outfit that day. And not- <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, um, yeah, it, it, it's such an important concept. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the the rainbow itself that you've yeah. now developed. And um, am I right in saying it was it was published just last year, wasn't it? Yeah, it was actually this past April. Oh, um, this past April. IAABC published it in their journal. Um, so it's a framework for building resilience, uh, the resilience rainbow. And so this is something Kathy and I co-created. Um, we, in the conversations we were having around resilience, in the trauma research, there's four domains is already like shows that working through those domains makes a massive difference. Like so social support, safety and security, mental and physical well-being and um, agency. Those are the four that the trauma research tells us is- Is that in humans? Humans, humans, yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And so when she and I started exploring what else is out there in the resilience literature and what we've anecdotally been part of or witnessed with, you know, for me, my clients in the sports world, my own dogs, for her, working um, in Rottweiler welfare. She was part of um, a massive like uh, Rottweiler rescue organization in the UK. She had many Rottweilers over the years that came from difficult situations. She's worked with many of them. And then her current dog, Nancy, uh, which was, she's um, a stray essentially from Romania. So a streetie, uh, it, even though she looked like she was taken care of, she was astray and she came with a lot of trauma. And so we looked at what else, what else is going on because those domains are not enough is what we were seeing. And we looked, so we looked at predictability as the, one of the other domains, decompression, and then completing the stress cycle. And are there others that build and support resilience? I'm sure there are. And those are the ones that we kept coming back to as like the ones that made the most sense in the work that we were doing, the ones that we kept um, pulling to or looking at or the games that are already out there and techniques and training tools that are already out there. And then others that we were expanding on fell into those domains. Um, So we said, okay, seven, seven's nice. 
a nice number. It's like not a lot. It's, you know, I think a manageable amount of domains for people to explore and look at as a framework. And then, you know, Kathy's so brilliant and creative. She said, well, just like a rainbow. And, and it's fun to say resilience rainbow. It's a memory aid, seven colors, seven domains. And so we have the resilience rainbow. And I can give you the link for the articles if you want to share it with everybody. Yeah, brilliant. I'll definitely put those in the chats for anyone that hasn't seen those. That we can go off and have a read of that um, yeah. yeah, publication in the IWABC journal, which is, yeah, really, really informative on, on kind of the process. And um, so, so, so you mentioned you added, added a few there as well. Are you able to just talk us through very briefly kind of how you define, um, was it decompression, completing the stress cycle? And which was the other one you added? Predictability. Predictability. <laughs> Yeah. So predictability is fantastic because um, if you're looking at training in general and you're looking at creating a training program, uh, you're looking at if it's fear and phobias. Uh, I, I often found that we're making things as predictable as possible or like ritualizing experiences beyond routines. But actually, for example, a lot of my um, clients with dogs that were fearful of unfamiliar people and would be either be aggressive or hide when guests would come over. We created a guest protocol. Like this happens, then this happens, then this happens. And this happens this way every single time somebody comes over. And what I started to see is like, okay, they're warming up faster. They know what to expect. If they see a target stick or if they see a certain action that their person takes, and then this, they know what this is gonna look like. They know that they're safe and secure. They know. And so um, I worked with one Boston Terrier for years, on and off for years, and the um, Guardian moved essentially three times in the three years we were working together and traveled uh, a little bit back and forth to see her family and come back into the city. So she had to keep hiring dog walkers because she moved, right? And so what we, so we would use this technique and by the, by the time she moved to Florida, like she's like, the dog was like, oh, get it, I get it. Like this happens, this happens. She was able to introduce him to new people so fast and settle into their home in Florida and they're doing, he's doing so well. And, and the amazing thing about this kind of predictability is that it builds on itself. It just keeps building on itself. Then there's also pattern games, right? So Leslie McDevitt has created a set of patterns games that are amazing. And then there's so many other ways to create this sort of pattern or pattern experience, or there's other folks that have created games that feel like a pattern for the dog. Um, but I like to go to Leslie's because she's already created them. We know they work and like, we can just pull it from the toolbox and say, let's try this one now. And let's try this one now. And if anybody's interested in, they can go to Fr Friends of Controlled Unleashed to learn more about pattern games on Facebook. And so the predictability of the pattern game, like you can do this very simple game. And I found like my clients love them because they're so easy. No matter what, just do the up and down game, put a treat on the ground, the dog eats it, they look up, you put another treat on the ground, the dog eats it, they look up. It's so simple for them to follow. Or the one, two, three game is count to three, give a treat as you're walking, count to three, give a treat as you're walking. Because these games are so simple, the guardians can do them and execute them like even if they're just walking around the city block, right? And there's so much going on. Um, they don't have to think as much about timing and mechanics and like, it just, it makes it simpler for them. So then they do it. And if they do it, we see improvement. And then if we're looking at everything through neurobiology versus the operant lens, it's just about, you know, you creating and strengthening neural pathways and that's it. And, and if we're just practicing, 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 you start to see a change in the dog's behavior. And so I just love this concept of this domain of predictability for that reason. Yeah, and, and I think what what's kind of an incredible about that is because of course, as we spoke about, you we can't take away the unpredictability of everything, right? But what mm -hmm. that kind of does in the way that you described is it, is it kind of builds predictability around that unpredictability Absolutely. so yeah friends are going to come over they could be it could be you know <laughs> your crazy excited friend it could be the dog lover friend it could be you know any whoever but at least we know that actually when the friends comes around we're going to tap this or we're going to go over there and sit there or do this yeah. and uh, I just love the idea of being able to build um this kind of 
understandable, predictable routines. So we kind of take some of that anxiety away. So we're like, yeah, we're not sure what this human that's going to come around is going to be that we just heard ring the bell or whatever. But we do know that we're going to do this, this and this when they come in. And that's quite nice and usually fun. Yeah. And it provides a a sense of ease. And then also for the guardian, because they're like, I know what to do to support my dog to prevent a problem. Or I know what to do to support my dog in meeting this person that's really important to me, but new in my life, you know, things like that. And people, I've had people that felt like they were prisoners in their home or they couldn't have friends over or family over, they could have over time start to have that. Um, And so it's pretty amazing when you can just offer predictability and then reinforcement strategies, like the biggest issue in dog sports and in terms of performance decline is suddenly the rules of the game change in terms of how the dog has access to reinforcement or access to whatever it is that they really want, like a motivator, a toy, food, whatever. And over time that, again, it's like a bummer and it chips away at resilience. So then you see a decline in performance, but if you can make it predictable for the dog and there's all these games to make it predictable, now you're providing predictability in sometimes what feels like an unpredictable environment, which is the competition ring, whatever kind of competition you do. And not every dog has that kind of like, intense high drive like I must do the game and then even those dogs can become highly aroused and then you see some fallout behavior like biting frustration barking or they're just doing their own thing instead of following you in terms of what has to get done so that level of impulse control and making choices based on the rules of the sport you're doing can fall away so yeah predictability there's so many things that can fall into predictability yeah, and that's me. I could talk about you that, that about with you all day. It's just fascinating to hear about, yeah, some of the different ways that that you've applied that as well in 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 things that I don't do, such as dog sports. So it's um, yeah, it's it's yeah, so so much that yeah that 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 can really be used to target, and it just again it really does feel like you're opening up such a wider toolkit than that kind of classic operant approach to changing behavior which does sometimes feel quite limiting and I know a lot of people in our industry do feel this quite limiting to start off with Um, it's one piece of this puzzle and it's such a necessary piece and it's only one piece yeah and so the other two that we were that I wanted to just touch on as well quickly if that's all right is um the completing the stress cycle Uh, so yeah we start with completing the stress cycle what 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 does that mean well, I'll have to talk about decompression too, because a lot of people okay. will say once we start <laughs> talking about the two, they'll say, well, this sounds like the same thing. So, you know, your nervous system is activated. So it's, um, think of it like the, so the HPA axis is activated, hypothalamic, pituitary, adrenal gland axis, like that whole axis. Um, and that is the sort of stress response access to make it simpler for people to hear without having like the diagrams and pointing to the different organs and glands. So, um, and the, the amazing thing about the stress response, and this is what blew my mind when I first started learning about this is that even good things can, can activate the nervous system and you can have a stress response, like not just bad things, not just being stuck in traffic, not just feeling (laughs) the, the, you know, the anxiety and the stress of like, oh my God, I've got a major deadline or a major presentation I've got, um, you know, or, or something happening in life that feel like a divorce, like those kinds of things are not the only things that activate the nervous system and create a stress response in the body. It could be things that you're really excited about as well. Things that make you really happy because what it is, is it's not stressed in a bad way. It's just the activation of the HPA access because it's preparing the body for whatever is happening or about to happen that the body needs to do that requires more energy, um, more oxygen in the blood, more focus in the brain. Um, A good example would be like surfing. I started surfing and I love surfing. Um, I'm brand new to it, but it requires a level of focus. So I am sure the HPA access in my body is activated so I can really time out like, when do I start swimming and paddling to catch a wave, balancing the body? Like it requires so like oxygen for my muscles to like work the board, you know, there's so much to it. And I love it. 
Like it is fun. It is so much fun. And I meet up with friends and this is what we do. So it's not always like this horrible, bad thing that happens. Um, so if that's what you're understanding about stress, then that means that activation, like you're, it goes up, but then we need to do something to bring it back down. And that's decompression. And in the human literature, and this is kind of like in popular psychology now, we understand the value of meditation. We understand the value of mindfulness, exercise, things to do that can support in decompression, meaning bringing that stress cycle back down, walks in nature. But the difference between completing the stress cycle and decompression is completing the stress cycle means you've, as your nervous system has been activated, the HPA axis, and then it's coming all the way back down to your individual baseline. That's completing the stress cycle. Whereas decompression, you might come down a little bit or you might come down all the way, right? So it all, it varies. It varies on what's going on in that situation, in that context. Um, so that's why like when people go on vacation, sometimes it can take a week and a half before they start to feel like, oh, like their body has truly decompressed all the way till you feel like jet, like you feel like jello. You feel like you're so mellow. You're so relaxed. The muscles are so loose. And that's when you've completed the stress cycle in your body. Cause it's all in the body. It's all about how the body is carrying stress, how the body is dealing with the hormones that, um, or the chemicals that are activated to support the body in dealing with the stressful environment. And there's a really great book about this and it's for humans. But when I read it, I thought, oh my God, this is so applicable to dogs as well. It's by, it's written by Emily and Amy Nagowski called um, Burnout, Completing the Stress Cycle. And so they taught their uh, two sisters um, and they wrote about everything that's going on for the body and the, what the research says for humans is that the ways to complete the stress cycle will be like having a good laugh or hugging somebody for like 20 seconds, someone familiar, someone you really have a special relationship with, not just some random, <laughs> um, a good cry or being creative, like artistic music, writing, being out in nature, going, exercising and elevating your heart rate for a certain period of time. So these are all, or like a good scream, like those are things that can help complete the stress cycle for a human. And so there's versions of that for dogs as well. And I started applying it first to my dog, Marvel, uh, not Marvel, sorry, Topper, another terrier of mine, because I only read this book in 2020, and which was perfect timing, because I know I was so stressed we had just started the pandemic shutdown, like the whole world felt really unpredictable and really scary. And so my husband and I were just so conscious of like, we are so stressed right now. Um, we don't know what's going on, just like everybody else. Like, what can we do to take care of our bodies? Because even if, even at times when we, you know, we're home and we're safe, but really we didn't feel safe. Like our bodies were still dealing with everything that came from what's going on in the world. We don't know, are we safe? Are we going to die? <laughs> like, is the world over? You know, all of these things, do we, will we have a job? Like, how will we live? Like all of those thoughts were there. Um, and that stays in your body if you don't do things to help complete the stress cycle. And then over time, that creates chronic disease, chronic illness. And that's what, um, that's what all the human literature tells us. Yeah. and. Of course, the other thing with that as well is I would I would imagine, I don't know if this is something that you see with the dogs that you work with, but if we have got a dog that's been chronically stressed, it becomes harder to switch that stress mechanism, that HPA axis off as well. So I don't know, is that something that you look at within the resilience framework of how actually for these dogs that have very poor resilience that have perhaps been suffering with chronic stress, how we can actually rebuild that mechanism to complete the stress cycle and to actually kind of get yes. that HPA axis back down to baseline. Yes. And that's where, um, for my, uh, guardians that are in the pet world, for example, and, and, and sports world too, like relaxation is relaxation exercises, uh, like Karen overall, Dr. Karen overall's relaxation protocol or relaxation conditioning or anything along those lines. If it's, and I try to help my clients see it as like, if you're going to sit down and meditate, you know, a few times a week, that's what this is for your dog. 
And this indirectly will help your dog. We're not going to teach this game and then ask your dog to relax in the middle of like a park with children running around, right? This is to be done at home when things are quiet to support the nervous system in coming closer to baseline, if not all the way. So I, I remember this one particular pit bull that I worked with in New York City. Um, he was so hypervigilant, um, had been lunging at dogs and people when they walked in close proximity. And and it it felt very much like this conversation of, it, 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 like his nervous system was just on overdrive. Like we had to just settle him down. He needed behavior meds. He did, he was found emaciated, tied to a, chained actually to a truck at like seven months old, eight months old. Um, so clearly trauma, neglect, all of that. He was pulled into a rescue. Um, you know, we worked with him, uh, a couple adopted him. We worked with him. He's doing so well now. In fact, they just reached out to me and said, we're about to have a baby. So we want to just like check in and make sure everything's great, but he's doing so well. He has dog friends. Like they have people coming over all the time, but essentially all the work we did, it was not necessarily about, you know, dogs equal cookies or people on bikes are good. Yes, we did those things, but all the work we did was about providing safety and security, social support, predictability, addressing his mental and well being by putting him on behavior meds, um, providing agency as much as possible within a city environment. I mean, this, this couple was amazing. They actually moved to a ground floor apartment. They have like a little garden for him, you know, it just, and there's different things that you can do. So they practice relaxation 10 minutes every other night for, you know, for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. They did a lot of like sniffing exercises where they would hide treats all around the apartment and in the garden. So he had to go search for them again, practicing agency, ex exploring, um, Sniffing in general can be really, really healthy for the dog's brain depend and, and relaxing depending on the individual dog. For him, it was relaxing. We, what they started, what they reported to me is after a walk, even if the walk went well, meaning he did not bark and lunge at anybody, that was kind of what we were looking at. Um, he would come back and just race around the apartment, almost like like the zoomies around the apartment. And I said, I think that's a stress response. I think it was so hard for him out there coming back in your house he needs to do something to complete the stress cycle or to decompress so they would either tug with him afterwards to channel that or as a release or they would give him a snuffle mat and he would spend several minutes um, where they kept sprinkling in treats and he would eat the treats and then he would take a breath and then he could go lay down and relax and it was pretty incredible so we just would do this over and over and over again for about a year this kind of work. Yeah, I think that's a really helpful example as well, because I think the, the idea of getting getting my head around of what wouldn't be con completing the stress cycle Not is quite a dog. good way of yeah. seeing it. So if, if obviously we were to take this dog home and we were to let him run around for the next hour and do his own thing, then he wouldn't be having that opportunity to complete the stress cycle. Right, exactly. Right. And okay. then, so this, um, and then another example, so my dogs, um, after we have a competition weekend on Monday, they usually rest. And then Tuesday, I'll take them for a walk in the woods where they can just do whatever they want to do. And I really, and I try to time it at this particular place where I'm not going to see people and other dogs. So I don't have to practice recalling them and they can just have agency and, and, um, sniff and move the way that they want to move in directions that they want to go and we just walk together and so it's incredible to see like how much that has supported their resilience to do the hard things which is going into these competition environments plus my dogs also help me with my clients like I do see some clients in person and the three of the dogs help me to see clients I've retired a couple of the others from work they don't have to work anymore they're a bit older but the younger ones help out. And so I also make sure that they have decompression opportunities after working with the client. And yeah, I make sure that they're safe and you know they don't have to feel uncomfortable if this is a reactive dog and we're setting up at a distance so that there's no um, threat for them, uh, multiple layers of safety. And it's still pressure. It's still 
potentially stressful. So I make sure to do things afterwards to support them. Yeah. And um, I think that that makes so much sense because I think that's something intrinsically a lot of people learn to do sometimes with their own dog as well, because they realize yeah. actually we come back from wherever. <laughs> and particularly like, like particularly I should say with puppies, they learn that, oh my gosh, my puppy is off the wall after coming back from a walk or meeting some friends. And with puppies, I would say it's actually almost something that people start forgetting to do a little bit as their dog gets older. They start off realizing, oh yeah, oh. my puppy bites me and drives me crazy um, <laughs> after we've had a busy day or whatever but as the dog gets older it's perhaps something we forget to do a little bit I mean I don't know if that's something that you've considered as potentially contributing to why we might get a bit of a drop off in that resilience as the dog gets older oh that's a really good point I do want to I want to answer your question but it made me think of something with puppies yeah like they come back from a walk and they're highly stimulated because they're so even if they enjoy the walk there's so much stimuli coming into the brain now the brain that's potentially only you know the dog's only five months old, six months old, has to prioritize what they have to prioritize, process and store, whatever, you know, just sort it all out, all that information, all that stimuli. And they don't have the practice of it, like being an adult, like a six-year-old dog that goes out all the time and then comes back, right? Um, And the dog is zooming around and the guardian doesn't understand, like, we just went in the walk. Why are you so wild right now? Why are you bouncing off the walls? Why are you biting me? Is because their nervous system is on overdrive and they need something to decompress from that walk because the walk itself wasn't decompressing. Because again, we're looking at this neurobiologically. I do. And then going back to your question, um, I do think that this is just from what I can have observed. I think that some dogs do need that. They do need that additional support coming back from the walk, depending on the dog, right? So if the dog, if the walk was highly stimulating for them, mentally highly stimulating, then absolutely they need to have something to support them in decompressing after the walk, like being in an urban environment, that can be hard. Um, coming back and maybe giving your dog something to chew for like 20, 30 minutes can really support them in decompressing. I did that with my terriers when I lived in New York City for two years. Um, after a walk, I'd always give them something to chew. And then for some dogs, like if I take a walk around my neighborhood where I live now, it is super quiet. I live in a suburban area. There's hardly any people around um, and they don't need it. They come back and just lay down. So you want to observe your dog and see, watch their behavior. What are they doing after that walk? And then support them accordingly. And that actually leads on to my next question as well, because I was going to say, surely there must be a lots of differentiation and, and, and sort of nuance that you have to apply when thinking about the individual dog you're working with, with all of those factors, really, in terms of what makes a dog feel safe or, or what might complete a stress cycle for an individual dog or what kind of social support might look like as well. I think that's quite an interesting one to think about because, of course, some dogs love having a companion, whereas some dogs are very fearful of companions yeah. So it's, yeah, I mean, what are your thoughts on the kind of the differentiation aspect of it? Yeah, so I think that I've always been someone who's like not the most systematic person. Like I'm like I don't work with spreadsheets. I'm not a fan. We I have a colleague here at Behavior Vets who is like the spreadsheet king. He's amazing. Um, but yeah, I'm very much I, I've always done things by feel. That's just the way that I work with my clients or my own dogs. And that doesn't mean that I don't record keep and track things. But I'm very much like, what's working for you in this moment? Let me just have a massive toolbox to pull from. And truly what I've observed is like moment by moment that could change. Maybe because of adolescence, maybe because of the environment, maybe because of like what mood they're in that day, right? And considering all of that, the their emotional state, um, how I'm feeling, is that influencing them on that day? If I had a stressful week or something, am I exhausted today? Am I irritable today? Um, so I'm very much, uh, really looking at the dog in the moment and seeing what works and I'll try stuff. I've, I've gotten to the point in my career where I'm, I'll try stuff. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And I'm like, okay. And I'll tell the client, I'll say, you know what, let's try this now. It might not work. Right. Like going back to that pit bull, I said, let's give him a bit of a tug session when he gets home. And they thought, well, won't that make him crazier and wilder? I said, 
maybe, but let's see what happens. You know, I, he's safe. He adores you guys, but let's see if that can be a release for him or does it make him spiral more? Because that was definitely something that I was concerned about with his arousal spiral. And it completely was a release for him. And because, and then we started to use it actually when we would work with dog to dog issues. Sorry. Oh, sorry. My series talked to me on my phone. <laughs> um dog to dog issues at the park where we would meet at a park work a distance away from the other dogs and he would observe them and there were times that we would take tug breaks with him and then go and then every time he had a tug break he actually had less muscle tension in his body when he would go look at the dogs and was more um his ability to re-engage with his guardian was better and increased um so yeah, you just have to try stuff sometimes and see what works as long as you can set it up with the person you're working with and make it safe with the, with them and the dog. Yeah, and I I love I love that that it does offer so much, right? This room <laughs> in terms of things that you can yeah. try. It is nice to have that framework in place that you can kind of turn to and have that kind of also for us in 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 kind of a consulting environment, there's a lot to think about when you're working with dogs and 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 kind of what avenues you might want to go down. But as you say, it kind of um, brings in a lot of things that are there already and available in the world already. It just kind of gives a bit of navigation to those as well, which is quite nice, as well as obviously bringing in some new stuff and new approaches there. Um, so, yeah, and, and the other thing I just wanted to touch on is, is presumably there's overlap as well between some of the interventions. And there's interventions, I would guess, that might, you know, make me help a dog feel safe and secure, but also mm -hmm. provide um, Social support. decompression. Yeah, absolutely. Like a good cuddle can provide decompression, completing the stress cycle and social support, right? On the couch, if the dog enjoys that and you enjoy that. Um, one of the games that I really like to do with dogs that are sensitive to the environment and whatever's going on, or even puppies, even if I'm just raising my puppies, I would do this for my clients is world watching. I'm like we're going to sit a certain distance away that your dog can watch what's happening in the world without necessarily triggering a response in the nervous system, right? So we just want them in terms of an activation, like they can just observe, but really manage themselves, manage their own arousal, manage their own emotions. So it's not close enough to spike anything, but it's not so far away that they're just not, they're not noticing things in the environment and just world watching is what I call it. And that can accomplish, that can go work across so many different domains in general. And you're just sitting quietly with your dog providing social support. There's also a level of predictability, like, hey, when we sit here, this is what's going to happen. This is how we're going to do this. They feel safe and secure because you're sitting far enough away and they understand this process of how this works. Um, and it's incredible what they can do and what they learn to do in terms of their own arousal management um, or regulation when you can give them those opportunities and they discover like, oh, everything's okay. Right. And that's just like a, such a, and I, I have clients that do that all the time. I'm like, well, okay, you can't get to a park. Let's just sit on your front steps. As long as it's not overwhelming your dog, mm. that kind of thing. Yeah. And that's such a, such a valuable skill, isn't it? Of course, being able to manage that independent arousal management that mm -hmm. I think, again, kind of sometimes can get missed out uh, mm -hmm. in some of the training techniques that are out there is is yeah being able to teach that ability to manage your arousal but also hand yeah. that over to the dog a little bit so then if you're not there or if it's a different situation they can do that independently and I think that's what I don't know to me is anyway captured very well within that resilience rainbow thank you thank you so much <laughs> Um, so Bobby, we're at the end of the hour, so it's been great talking to you, but to finish wow. off, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you, um, or behavior vets or, um, and anything cool that's coming up that you want to share with us really? <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Lots of cool things coming up. So, uh, Dr. Kathy Murphy and I are doing the last seminar of this year for the resilience rainbow in Asheville, North Carolina, uh, December, I believe it's 9th and 10th, I think are the dates or if not 10th and 11th, so I apologize. Um, but they're correct in the calendar. It's just that second weekend of December um, in Asheville, North Carolina. And we're actually partnering up with Kim Brophy and we're gonna see you at the conference, which is exciting to meet you in person finally. Um, we're also speaking at the Legs Conference. So we're partnering with her as well 
with a special golden ticket opportunity. If people want to come to both, they can come to both. We also have a virtual version. So if people want to purchase a virtual ticket, if they can't come to the States um, or just, or even in the States and can't travel to North Carolina, they can do that. And then um, Dr. Murphy and I are, um, we have a side project called Brain Camp and it's for dog sports folks. And so we have a camp coming up December 1st, 2nd and 3rd, also in North Carolina. Um, we happening in North <laughs> we're Carolina. Gonna be, <laughs> we're going to be in North Carolina all of December. Um, if folks want to follow me on my Facebook page, um, Bobby Bambry, uh, Workma, my husband's, uh, so it's hyphenated, my husband's last name. We are going to post some information about Brain Camp there. We, I also do a lot of Brain Camp webinars. Um, this is all like bringing neuroscience into dog sports. It's so awesome. It's so fun. And then um, we're doing some events next year for Resilience Rainbow. And then also, if anyone's ever interested in anything about resilience or neuroscience or just anything regarding like behavior meds, we have so many webinars on the Behavior Vets website. So if you go to behaviorvets.com, um, you can check out our webinars. We have a massive library and Daniel will be presenting for us this fall in September and October for a couple of really cool um, webinars. So you guys at home. Uh, sign up for the neurobiology of frustration. And then we also have one on prey and predation, which is pretty cool. Amazing. Brilliant. Well, it's been fantastic talking to you. I definitely will. If you send me all the links for those things as well, I can Go put ahead. them in the uh, discussion for today. So then they're in there for anyone that is looking for some of those links. I think I've, I think I've actually got most of them, but I'll message you if there's anything I can't find. Thank you. Um, and um, yeah, it's been fantastic talking to you. Thank you so much for joining me today. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll, well, it sounds like we'll, I'll see you soon anyway in the December conference. Yes. Um, it's December, isn't it? Yeah, December yeah. conference. And um, yeah, it's been brilliant. Hopefully we'll, yeah, speak again soon. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming along.